So today I'm recording a YouTube video on our team meeting because I added a new chapter to the, the team documentation website. It's about backing up your computer. Um, and that's because um, as many of you know, we are actually um, changing our compute system for like all laptops at Libre. Um, so this only applies to, pe to people that have a laptop that was bought by the Institute. Um, and since I, I went first, uh, because I wanted to see what was going to happen, the experience, um, to maybe make it a bit easier for you. Um, so, um, in this new chapter that I wrote, I talk about backing up your, your computer and mostly you have options for Mac and Windows. Um, but most of the text you'll see is written for Windows, for Mac, um, Mac users. So first of all, um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain the general um, idea of the chapter and like some like a lot of the details. And then we'll also spend time talking about um, setting up our packages. Um, um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna minimize the menu here on the left and increase the font size. But, so, um, um, many of you know, I pay for a Dropbox account myself, right? The Institute does not pay for them. Um, what the Institute provides though is access to OneDrive. Um, and so um, on the new version that we're all going to get, we're gonna have one terabyte per account. So that should be plenty if you wanna use um, OneDrive as a way of backing up um, a lot of files in your computer. Um, 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 but like the rest of what I'm gonna be talking about is like using Dropbox because that's what I mostly use um, myself. Now, um, one option that you have with as a Mac user is making backups with something called Time Machine. Um, and so for that, I recommend getting like a, an external, external hard drive. A lot of us have USB-C um, computers that have a USB-C port. So I would recommend using that because it's faster than a regular USB um two or three um, and so time machine right like this is like nice little graphic over here you have something that looks like this that you plug into your computer and then um it will back up everything um that you have on your computer on your mac computer um then if, you, if something happens to your computer or you have to reformat it like we have to right now then you can use the time machine to restore a lot of things. Um, um, now, uh, so it works quite well, uh, but as you increase the number of files in, in, in your computer, it will take um, quite longer to run, right? And so if you're using Time Machine in general, a limitation of it is you have to actually choose how frequently you want to update it. Um, you can update the files in your external hard drive every one hour if you want to, but that means you always have to have it plugged into your computer. Um, or um, you can choose to do it like daily, weekly, et cetera. Um, if you do it more frequently, that means that you have fewer files to back up at that point, and so the backup will run pretty fast. If you do it less frequently, that, mean, that means that it can take several hours. In my case, um, sometimes when I backed up every um, every few months, it would um, it would take like maybe eight hours to run or stuff like that, six hours. Um, now the challenge is that if you do it less frequently, um, then um, um, then you're basically pretty much exposed, right? That means like if there's any kind of failure in your computer on an unexpected thing then your time machine backup is basically useless at that point, right? Let's say uh, the last time you backed up was four months ago. Um, a lot of things can happen in four months. You might have a lot of new things and a lot of files. So um, even though you can like maybe save you some work, you're still gonna lose a lot of protected information you wanted to keep around. Um, so, but in general, time machine can be great if you know when you're gonna have to do an update or, uh, you know, change machines or stuff like that. Um, it can also be quite cost effective because you can get an external hard drive that's like between two and five terabytes or, or like less than a hundred bucks. 
which if you compare it again, is like how much Dropbox costs across multiple years, then you'll be like, well, that's actually cheaper um, getting the external hard drive. Um, of course, the, it can have these failures. This has happened to a few of my external hard drives. Eventually they fail, right? So it's not something that you buy and keep that device for forever, right? You basically keep it around not for maybe around three years or so. Um, and checking the, the guarantee of the, pro of the product is like a good like idea of knowing how long that's going to last. Um, and also you only have one of them, right? So if you lose it, you know, you drop it, it breaks, something happens to it, then everything is lost, unlike the cloud. Um, so besides using like a time machine backup, right, which is the easiest way to restore things, I also have a cloud backup. Um, now, um, uh, Dropbox and basically other tools now, like Google Drive, you want to use Google Drive as your backup system, or like even OneDrive and stuff. They have um, a nice way of backing up um, a lot of things that you use on your computer, a lot of your files. Um, and so um, let's say you have files on your desktop that you want to back up. Uh, Dropbox can do that pretty easily. And so um, um, what it does actually behind the scenes is that it can help you back up files on your desktop, your documents, and your downloads. That's pretty much a lot of the files you probably want to keep around. Um, and um, for you, probably you mostly save your, your vital files, right? Your vital information. Um, and so how, how these tools do it is that, uh, for example, in Dropbox, inside of that directory, is going to um, uh, uh, copy them inside of it, such that like um, Dropbox will automatically back them up. And it will create some type of links. It's not exactly like a soft link, but it's similar in concept to a soft link, such that like um, um, any other program that is expecting something on forward slash desktop will be able to access it, right? So like other programs won't be affected by the reality of having files under like forward slash Dropbox, something else. Uh, forward slash desktop. Um, and so that's pretty nice. And it sounds pretty comprehensive, but it's actually missing things that you might want to back up. It's going to um, miss software that you have installed um, that maybe you want to back up. Um, things like um, um, any configuration files for software that you use. Let's say, for example, your RCU preferences. Um, any like Linux style configuration files and any like Linux style software that you install outside of the applications directory. Uh, so like if you're using Homebrew on a Mac machine to install software. Um, so all, all of that is actually backed up by Time Machine. So that's like really good if you're using Time Machine. But um, for a cloud option, you actually need to do extra work. So this is some of the extra work that I do. So under my Dropbox, I created a directory called Mac files. Um, and so for applications, um, what I do is fairly simple. So sometimes what I do, have done is like, I just go to the applications directory, um, uh, see the files like as a list, and just take screenshots and save those screenshots. Of like what, what is all the things that I have installed? Um, you could also do it like programmatically, right? Like by listing like the contents of the application directory. Um, so either, either way you do it, is, it works. Um, and the idea of this is you want to have like a bit of a recipe so you can remember what is the software that you had installed, right? Um, and a lot of times software that you have installed, you can like Google it, uh, Google search it, right? And find like how to install it again. Um, but that doesn't work for everything. Um, um, and so in my case, um, um, do we go to Dropbox, um, Mac files? You'll notice here that like I actually like copied a few things like Stata, uh, Poster Genius, is on writer, some tools that I cannot easily install again. Um, and so basically, I just manually copy paste them uh, from that application directory to this um, Dropbox Mac files. Um, 
so that maybe could be because uh, maybe you don't you don't have the software the files for installing the software again. Maybe you don't have the license files anymore, et cetera, right? And you want to keep those around. Now, this doesn't work all the time because um, um, software can change, right? And like Mac computers have changed across time, like the type of chips they use and all of that. So it doesn't always work, but it can work in a lot of cases. So that's for the um, software that you have. Now, uh, for if you're using Homebrew to actually install software, um, like Linux type of software, um, um, there's a few things you can do. This it's, it's actually works quite well. Um, and so what I did is uh, under my Mac files, I created a, a, a directory called root. You can call it whatever name you want. And there I have four shell scripts. The first one is this one of lead root file, which basically just runs this command, root bundle dump. Uh, that command creates a, a file called root file, and it creates a list of software that you have installed. And so later on, if you want to reinstall that software, um, there's another um, uh, homebrew command that you can run, and that will take us input that root file and then reinstall everything. Um, and so this is quite useful. Um, for example, you'll notice here that um, I installed Git via homebrew. I also install Go and Ugo for, um, uh, these are tools that I use for the Liber Arsets Club website, as well as my own personal website. Um, uh, I, I install Pandoc that way, which is something we use quite a bit when needing with our markdown. Um, but in general, I try to keep this list pretty small. Um, and that's because um, uh, for compiling R packages, um, I do not use Homebrew. That's not what is recommended by CRAN. So I, um, and we'll, we'll go into that um, a bit later. Um, we'll check the R setup stuff. Um, um, so a lot of you maybe don't actually use Homebrew to install any like Linux software, but if you do, this is one way you can do it. Um, to then restore things, I have this restore Homebrew uh, script that basically just runs the brew bundle command, which that one expects to have a brew file um, in that same directory where you're running it, and that will like install everything again. So that it works pretty well. Now, um, besides that, um, there's a, you probably have like Linux style configuration files that you want to back up. Um, so that include like your RST preferences, some bundles that I have for TextMate, maybe other things like some cyber log files, et cetera. So this, this script over here is basically like a guide of like what are the things that I want to make sure I'm copy pasting, right? Um, so you'll see there's a lot of arc scene commands that basically, for example, I want to save my R history file, my R environment, the contents, contents of the .R directory, which contains information about how to compile software if you're, if you're using any of that. My um, my R profile, the files I ignore globally in Git, um, all the information I use for connecting to other computers on that SSH directory, and a few other things, right? Um, 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 like text made some things. I want to also save like how to um, all the R C to configuration work that I've done, right? I want to save all those settings that I have. Uh, at the end, I also like. Um, make sure that I have a new brew file, like I remove the current one and make sure I run the previous script. Um, um, so that's what that command does, uh, that script does, sorry. And it's called, um, I call it update files, sh. Um, um, so that basically just copies things that you have on different parts of your computer and puts them in this Dropbox directory. In my case, you can do it anywhere else, right? Now, um, uh, um, to then restore things, um, once you have like downloaded all your files from the cloud service, then you can like copy them back. So this is what uh, this other script, restore files SSH, is doing. Um, one thing, for example, in particular, is like when you restore the SSH directory, you have to actually fix the permissions of it. Um, otherwise, um, you won't be able to to log in, right? Uh, so they're basically telling the your computer that the SSH directory is only accessible by you and no one else, not the group, not, not other people. Um, 
So, um, uh, of course, you have to have installed RStudio before you run this, right? And like Cyberdoc and a few other things, right? If you, like, or TextMate. If you don't have the software installed, it's not going to run right well. Um, um, so, um, um, a few other things are like, just like I took screenshots of my applications, I also take screenshots of like, uh, what are all the Slack workspaces I have? And for example, a Mac doc um, set up at the bottom of the screen. I actually forgot to do that, um, the doc one for this last update. So um, uh, I'll try, I'll need to think, I'll need to like try to remember what was the order of how I had things on my bar, on my doc bar. Um, then I also keep around, um, 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 let me go to Dropbox. I have a different directory called computing. Um, I keep around here things like, for example, the Cyberdoc license file, just because I bought it once. I gave some money. Right? That way, like, it doesn't ask me for donating money all the time. Or like uh, my Alfred uh, license or my Hyper Hyperdoc license. Or um, if you use iTerm for your terminal window, you go to the settings. Um, and then under your profiles, yeah, if you have a profile you like, um, uh, you can like save that profile or, or all your profiles as JSON files. Um, I didn't put it on, on the website because it's like uh, a file is like 350 lines long. So it like, didn't make sense to have it there. Um, some other things that you might want to keep around is, for example, um, like on Sotero, which is um, a software I use um, for um, importing um, like PDFs and stuff when I look at a website. Um, uh, you can um, log into your account and that will help you sync your files. Um, so that's something you can do there for Sotero. Um, Alfred app, which is this app that I use uh, for searching files and stuff as a way of um, um, things that are advanced, yeah. Um, you can make sure that your settings are backed up and you can put them on Dropbox if you want. So it's already, it already has some of those things built in for saving your, your comfort, your settings and preferences. Uh, one tab, which is, um, something that I use quite a bit. Also, you can export your list of bookmarks um, and then report them later on on your new computer. So there's a, I do this for a few different uh, tools. You probably need to check, right, what software you're using and see if there's ways you can save some preferences. Um, now, you might not want to save everything, right? Like um, Time Machine is a way of saving everything. If you're doing this with a cloud storage, it's, it's a way of basically being intentional on what you want to save, um, uh, but then also being intentional on what you don't want to save, right? And so that, that can be a way of like resetting your computer and making sure you have less software in your new computer than you had in the previous one. That way you remove things that you're probably not using anymore. Right? But you just have to be very conscious about this, right? Because otherwise you might regret, like if you, don't, if you didn't back up things you actually wanted to keep, you're going to regret it later, right? Um, um, so that's, a, and, and for Windows, it's a similar story. So um, with having said all of this, I'll go now into more details for us as we are our users. So these details already existed uh, on the documentation website. Um, and so one of them is for Mac, if you're selling R, um, you'll go to CRAN and look like, um, uh, you go to CRAN, uh, download R for Mac, and then you'll you'll download the right version for you. Right? But that's just R. Uh, a lot of times we actually need to have the, the tools needed for compiling packages on our computers. And so for that, there's just these two links, the tools and the binary files. So for the tools, um, it's fairly simple. There's only two things you need to do. You need to make sure you have the Xcode developer tools installed 
And so basically that involves like copy pasting this command on your terminal window, running it. You're gonna get a little prompt um, and accept installing some things. The other thing you need to have is a Fortran compiler. And there's a link here to actually download in the, the correct version for, for R. Um, that's for um, uh, having the basic tools for compiling our packages. Um, some other things is you're gonna need like binaries of like uh, a bunch of libraries and they made it quite easy. Uh, basically you just uh, source this command, this script um, on an R window. You have to actually have um, open R with the pseudo powers. Uh, if you don't, if you don't do that, then the rest of the commands are not going to work. Right? Um, so you open R on the terminal window with sudo, um, uh, source that script, and then you just install everything. This runs like, you know, in two minutes or something like that. It runs pretty fast. Um, and so this is the highly recommended way of installing any uh, dependencies that you need for compiling R packages on a Mac computer. Um, if you uh, um, like, um, uh, I think there's some warnings here, like you can do it in, in other ways or maybe on the other cramp, um, website. Um, one of these pages for cramp, there's some details about how you can do it with homebrew, but then you need to know really well what you're doing. Uh, otherwise you can like, uh, have incompatible versions of the software that is needed for installing, um, our packages from scratch, right, from compiling them. Um, so that's one thing, just having your basic R set up ready. The other thing is this information about R packages. Right? So on the, on the website, we already had information about um, um, how to install like packages from scratch. That's what all these commands are showing. Um, and I mean, that's highly tailored to like what I like to do. Uh, so you might have a different version. But before you actually um, 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 like lose access to your current computer, um, something that I highly recommend is saving the list of packages that you have installed in your computer. So I have this command that is like, just like if I'm on Windows, this is the path where I have things on my Windows machine. If otherwise, I'm on my uh, Mac machine, this is where I have things saved on my Mac machine. Um, and so, uh, and then a JHPC, this is what I use. Um, so basically here, um, I locate like, what are the packages that I have installed, um, on, on my computer, save them to a little R data file. So this is just a character vector that I save. Um, so later on, on, an, on the new computer, right, um, um, I can like, find all of those files, load the last one, and then compare and contrast, like what is the current list of packages I have installed against like the ones that I'm missing or the ones that are new on this computer. So I'll run that here um, manually, um, just so you can see the list. So, um, um, let's see here, which are the previous files that I have. So I haven't, I haven't like been doing this, I guess, since 2015. And so the last one is from um, two days ago, um, February 26, 2024. So that's the one I'm gonna load. And in, the, in this new computer, on this computer, I actually just, I, I have run all these commands before for like installing packages from scratch. Um, I haven't run anything else. Um, so now I can compare like, what are my current list of packages? What are the ones that I'm missing to the ones I had installed on my computer like two days ago? And so here I can see that there's, I'm missing like 70 something packages. Some of them are like these example packages that I make when I'm teaching about bias CDs and I don't need to install them again. Um, other ones is um, like this one, Lifino, which no longer exists anymore. Um, um, 
But then, for example, there's this Omic Navigator package, which is, was the package that we saw on the RSX Club with um, Josh Souls a few months ago. And that one, I think, installed a lot of the dependencies. Um, so a lot of all these other packages that I see on this list. So at this point, you can make the conscious decision whether like you need to have them or not. If you, if you say, like, I need to have them all, then like line 211 will try and install them all, unless some of them exist on, um, on GitHub at that point. Uh, line 211 is not going to be able to install them. Um, but in my case right now, I'm going to make the conscious decision of not to install the 79 packages again. Um, I might need to at some point, um, but um, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to avoid doing that for now. Um, um, in any case, I have the list of, of things I have installed in the past. So, I mean, for example, I recognize Basilisk um, on Airway. Is our like example? Um, Airway is, a, is an experiment data package from Bioconductor. Basilisk is for like building um, our packages that have Python dependencies um, in con environments. Um, I don't actually use this right now, so I feel like I don't need it. Uh, but maybe you do, right? Um, um, and so this kind of like. Um, this is very similar to what I was talking about with like backing up your computer with a cloud service where you make sure you make a conscious decision of what are the things you actually want to save, but then also a conscious decision of the things maybe you don't need to, to have again. So um, uh, that's what I've done. If, if we look at like the list of packages that I have installed over time, um, like at some point I think uh, I had like around a thousand packages uh, right now I have like 619 installed, right? Um, um, so some of these packages, for example, this one um, is a database and that is probably gonna be several hundred megabytes big, right? And maybe I don't, maybe feel like I don't need it. Actually, this one, uh, this one might just be less than hundred, um, but there's other ones that maybe are, are larger than that. So um, this is a way of cleaning up sometimes packages. Uh, um, but uh, in order for all of this work, you have to save what is your current list of, of packages installed. Um, um, uh, so, um, uh, but I mean, all, all of this is like not new, right? There's a post about it, a blog post, and we um, have had some RSET clubs about these concepts in the past. Um, what is new is, the, is this chapter over here. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop the recording and you know, wish you good luck with backing up your computers. <laughs>